David, it is great to be here with you today. Thanks for joining me. For regular full readers and viewers, you need absolutely no introduction, but I'm going to introduce you anyway. You're, the, you're the, one of the co-founders of uh, The Motley Fool. You uh, lead the, the Rule Breaker Service, which has crushed the S&P 500. You are part of the Stock Advisor Service, one half of the Stock Advisor Scorecard, also crushing the S&P 500. And now you are working on, uh, I, I, I'd like to think that it's like a, a passion project for you, not that all of this isn't, but the, the Supernova Service. Uh, t tell the viewers a little bit about what the service is and what you're offering to uh, subscribers with that. Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say thanks, Matt, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation sure. today. I'm excited about it. Yes. So, uh, briefly, uh, Supernova is, uh, if you think of Stock Advisor and the stocks that I have in Stock Advisor and Rule Breakers mm -hmm. and a separate set of stocks and Rule Breakers, if you bring them all together and create a whole service that invests in portfolios, Okay. Um, that's what Supernova does. And Supernova has a fun space-oriented name. So we call our missions, uh, our portfolios missions. So it's almost like NASA. So you take my stock picks and you NASA them up and turn them not just from individual beads, but you start stringing necklaces. And that's, that's really what Motley Fool Supernova does. It's going to reopen uh, again in January of 2014. Uh, it's an exciting service. So, so thinking about rule breakers, thinking about Stock Advisor now, thinking about Supernova Odyssey, one of the things that I want to do here is get behind all of that to some of your thinking. And one of the places I want to start, because I've always thought of myself largely as a value investor. Okay. And I've heard you say time and time again that one of the things you look for in the stocks you invest in is that the financial media at some point has said that they're overvalued. And when I first heard you say that, I thought you were crazy. But then over the years, listening to you say it over and over again, I think I've gotten it down to, it's not that you're telling people to buy stocks or buy companies that are priced at more than they're worth. You're just saying that these companies are worth way more than anybody realizes that they're actually worth. Have I gotten that right yet? I think that's a pretty good way of thinking about it. Yes, one of the things I specifically look for are stocks that look too expensive to buy. They're trading, they, maybe they don't have enough earnings yet, or maybe there's such a premium brand or there's so much excitement about them that they have a crazy high P.E. ratio. Mm -hmm. This is not specifically how I screen or look at things. Sure. I don't even screen stocks at all, Matt, but, but I always have been a fan of stocks that look overvalued. And as it turns out, those are many of my best picks over the last 20 years. 10 baggers, 20 baggers plus sometimes. These are the companies that looked so overvalued sure. when we first found them. So, so a company like uh, Tesla, for example, that I think a lot of people are looking at right now and saying, uh -huh. whoa, the, the valuation on that is crazy when they look at the PE multiple, the eventual, the, the, the value of that company and what it can create is potentially worth so much more than that. Yeah, you know, I think here's what happens. First of all, um, the stock market always looks ahead. Mm -hmm. And this frustrates a lot of people who are looking backwards and looking at their financial statements and their multiples. And they're like, but it's already trading at 35 times last year's earnings, which is what P ratios usually do. They look backward. The stock market always looks forward, as you know. So when you have exciting futures, which is what I invest in, then the future looks much better than the past just looked. So that's part of the reason overvalued works. By the way, there's a whole dynamic to this, and um, that's the first key component, is that my companies typically are very innovative, so they have very bright futures, and so you end up, they look overvalued. Further, and then let's go to the next question. I don't want to go too deep on this, but further, a lot of them are premium brands and premium pricing. And it's kind of like when you buy a diamond at Tiffany, you're going to pay more than Diamonds R Us. And it's because um, when you shop at Tiffany, they have higher quality. And so you're going to pay a higher multiple or more than you thought you would pay for a diamond or more than you thought you would pay for food at Whole Foods or more than you thought you should pay for coffee at Starbucks. And the list goes on. So when you take those exciting futures I started with, the stocks already look overvalued. And then when you think about the premium pricing and premium brands, then it makes them look even more overvalued than that. And I mean, that, that's most of it. There's one final dynamic that I'll give only lip service to. But when it's very disruptive, mm. when a company has the chance, as Tesla does, to remake the infrastructure of how cars are done in the United States, that allows an extra dynamic of speculation, which 
in the best of times causes stocks to become 10 baggers, and in the worst of times can cause the stock to be cut in half in a day or two sure. sometimes. So those are three really key factors. And in the end, they're only going to be possessed by truly special companies. Some of them will fail. But those are the great companies, and those are the ones we buy and hold. Great. So th this, this year, uh, the, the Nobel Committee awarded a, a Nobel Prize in economics to Robert Schiller. And, and Robert Schiller, of course, he's done a lot of work in behavioral economics right. and swimming against the tide of efficient markets, which essentially say stocks are, are, are priced as they should be and there's no opportunity for individual investors like us to make any extra money by investing in individual stocks. In founding The Motley Fool, you and Tom, and then all of us fools that followed have obviously not followed the efficient markets hypothesis. Um, Schiller has sort of proved that out now. What gave you the confidence that, uh, that you'd be able to invest in individual stocks and make money doing that, even when the efficient markets folks were saying, you can't do that, it's not possible, just invest in an index fund? Well, I truly believe, by the way, that the concept that you can't be better than average applied to any discipline is silly, but especially when you think that that would have been put forward by academia with regard to investing. I think it's the kind of theory that can only exist outside of, well, maybe in academia, frankly. <laughs> I, you know, I don't want to quip too much here, but I, I think it's really a crazy notion that you can't be better than average at investing, but anything else that you pursue, there can be experts and there can be novices. Um, so Matt, I, you know, my simplest answer is that I watched my dad, um, as I grew up, beat the stock market on a regular basis, not by being an active person, but by finding great companies and sticking with them. I watched my uncle, who's a professional money manager, has been outstanding over the years. I watched people like Warren Buffett. Uh, I read Peter Lynch's book at a very early stage. So I, I, and I was taught the stock market as a kid. So I naturally just assumed that if you apply yourself, that you can, you can be superior. And then I happened to meet up with people like you and a whole bunch of our Motley Fool employees and community and people who have taught me, and we all teach each other about the stocks and businesses we're looking at. It gives us such an edge over the computers that we're competing against that are automating their trading and looking microsecond to microsecond, or the academics who say, oh no, it's not even worth trying because you can't do better than average, which I've always believed is silly. Um, so. That's how I think about it. Well, I, I got I to jump off on the, the computer comment that you made there. Th there has been a lot of concern about the supercomputers that are trading, the, the, the high-speed trading, all of that kind of stuff. There are investors and people in the media who are now saying that because of these computers, again, there's no more opportunity for individual investors because <laughs> you're going against the computers and you're never going to beat a computer. Are, are, is that it? Is our business over? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's... it's uh, well, I, I have to laugh because, of course, I, I think that computers, um, as much as I admire them, as much as, as I admire automation in general, and a lot of that high-frequency trading is actually not the evil bugaboo that it's often made out to be. It's really created much thinner spreads. And we as investors, uh, there's a lot less friction when we trade or when we buy and sell, lower prices all the way through, partly thanks to automated trading. But... Um, the, the supercomputer, the Watson, hasn't yet been invented that really, I think, will, will always beat the stock market or put people who use their own judgment out of business. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm very open to the possibility, and if so, I'd like to be invested in the com company and the computer that does that in time. Sure. But, uh, Matt, th you know, there, there's such a myopia. There's so much near-term focus, and most of the computers and the automated trading you're talking about are really dialed not into the day or hour or, or, or minute, but down to the microsecond. That's where a lot of it's happening. And that's a completely different game, of course, from long-term investing, which I think we're proving continues to show that it's the best way to create and grow wealth. So when I start to see computers that are really thinking in five-year increments, mm -hmm. then I personally and professionally will start to become <laughs> worried for my own job. But right now, I see computers dialing in more narrowly and more narrowly, programmed by humans, programmed by humans, and that's how they think, and that's their game, and, and they're welcome to play it. Um, it really doesn't even impact what you and I are doing, teaching, investing, and buying to hold as investors ourselves, great companies. Sure. And on the, on the opposite end of the spectrum from that, and you, you just mentioned Warren Buffett as somebody that you watched as, a, as proof 
that the markets aren't efficient and that you can buy, what one can buy sure. individual stocks and outperform. I saw an interview you did with Brian Richards earlier this year and another of our fellow fools, and you had mentioned that you admire Warren Buffett and you take some things from his approach, but then you leave some behind. Now, I was curious to hear, what's an example of one thing that you still use that you learned from Buffett? And maybe what's one thing that you've, you've said, I'll let Buffett have that and I'll go a different direction? Okay, well, I mean, there's too many answers to both of those, but to give one succinct one to each, um, I would say, first of all, from Buffett, I think we've all learned that investing is rational and long-term. And when you put those two things together, you will emerge with superior returns. And I think he's demonstrated that over the course of his life. And I think for The Motley Fool now entering its third decade of picking stocks online, I think our historical record demonstrates that. Um, how do I not do the Buffett thing? I mean, most of what I do isn't the Buffett thing. Um, I, I'll just answer that Warren, and in many cases those for whom he is an exemplar, have sort of opted out of technology or really even wanting to think about or use or invest in technology. Mm -hmm. And that's highly ironic to me because I think we live in the most exciting technological age of all time. And the opportunities to invest in companies early on like Amazon.com or more recently in things like cloud computing and 3D printing, I could not possibly sit here and say, I'm eschewing that, can't really predict where that's headed. So. You know, I, uh, our chief investment officer, Andy Cross, here at The Fool said, Dave, here's one thing I realize is the exact opposite for you with Warren. Warren likes to find a company that has one definite future. It's like C's Candies or Geico. It's going to be around 30 years from now. They're going to be doing the same thing. And he loves that, and his disciples do. And I certainly admire that. <clears throat> Andy does, too. So, Dave, you love the companies that have 30 possible futures. You love optionality. You love finding something that can all of a sudden morph into a whole different thing like Amazon.com books. All of a sudden, they're selling everything online. All of a sudden, they're actually doing cloud hosting and web services, and they've developed their own device, the Kindle, and it goes. And those are the companies that I love uh, where you're finding companies that can morph and grow in ways that people didn't expect or couldn't foresee, and it, me included. So, um, so I guess I love the companies with infinite possible futures, and there are a lot of people who are just looking for the one sure future. Sure, that makes sense. And, and thinking about those companies with, with a lot of different futures, a lot of different opportunity, you, you mentioned 3D printing, you mentioned cloud computing, which uh, to some extent it seems like the sky is, obviously the sky is not the limit, but it seems like it at some point because there's so much opportunity. When you are thinking about investments, how big of a role does market opportunity play? Is that, is that like number one on your list? I think that's really big for me. And when you say market opportunity, I mean, maybe all of our, all of our viewers know, know what you mean, but I'll just redefine it as um, how big could that business become? Um, and I think that is, I, I've used the, the phrase in the past, venture capital mentality. I think that's what I have. And I think that those who enjoy rule breakers or stock advisor, our Supernova members, a lot of us are practicing that more venture capital approach where it's not about the P.E. ratio. It's about looking management in the eye. It's not about um, uh, how the stock did over the last year. It's actually where the next five years of that technology is going to be. So you're so business focused relative to an investor world that I think is still largely too stock focused. People are looking at wiggles and waggles and, you know, 52-week uh, highs. But I think those who are taking our approach are really thinking about the market opportunity and asking ourselves, you know, how big could that technology be? E-commerce. Mm -hmm. And then that company, eBay, let's say, within e-commerce, how large could that grow over time? And, uh, and, so, and always looking ahead. And talk about optionality at a company like eBay, what, what you're just talking about. I mean, the, the, the size of the PayPal business within that. And who would have, who would have thought about that when it was just, uh, when it was just a, an online exchange? That's right. Well, the, the reason eBay is in the supernova universe, that it's on my side of the scorecard and stock advisor, is because it bought my pick, PayPal, out. Because I love finding often the, the companies like Marvel that Disney or Pixar, that Disney later comes along and buys, and we usually just keep holding right through. So I still own my Disney, right. but it's my Pixar and my Marvel and Disney, and I still own my eBay, but it was PayPal becoming eBay. So 
one of the tricks you can, you can learn over time, and by the way, it's never intentional on my part. I'm always as surprised as anybody when one of my companies gets lapped up. But one of the tricks is how you figured out how to buy Disney at a dramatic discount to Disney's price. And the answer was to buy a company that Disney's buying out that gets a 50% premium. That was the way to buy the best, biggest companies of our time at much cheaper discounts. That's that's something that Buffett could probably learn from you, Get, uh, getting in on those on those value type. Let uh, me say that I I've, <laughs> I I can't say I'm a student of it at all. I, I viewed it more as luck, so I I, I claim no omniscience yeah. or ability there. Uh, I will say though that Bob Iger at Disney clearly. Uh, share some thought with me because he keeps buying all my favorite companies. And I, I even did a video a few years ago, probably available somewhere on our website, saying, hey, Bob, I got your next one because you just bought out Pixar, which has been my one of my favorite picks. And then you bought out Marvel, one of my best performers ever. Go ahead and look at Discovery next because I think Discovery, as a media company and a company of the imagination, uh, would fit really well with Disney. Now, quickly, is it more of a happy day or a sad day for you when, I, when, when somebody buys out one of your I companies? think it's exciting. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm the first to say I think we would have made more on Marvel had Marvel stayed independent. At the same time, Disney's added things to Marvel that Marvel would have had to work really hard to get to, like all of a sudden having theme park rides for its, its characters or that great distribution or more, probably more Marvel movies this year than Marvel would have had on its own. So... And it's always exciting to see a premium and a stock all of a sudden be up 30% or 80% sometimes in a single morning because the big companies coming along to lap it up. So I, the, the, the fan and human in me thinks it's fun. Uh, in the end, if you don't want to stick with that bigger company, sell a stock, move on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump from there into some of, your, some of your past investments, and some of these are still some current investments. And okay. Mar Marvel is a great jumping off point since they right. just, uh, they're, they're doing a deal with uh, Netflix to, to come out with a, some series a few years from now. And I'm going to refer to my notes here because okay. I, I want to get this right. Netflix has been one of, one of your biggest winners a, as, a, as a pick. And I, I went back to 2003 and was reading Reed Hastings' letter to shareholders. And some right, of what so he wrote- 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Okay. It, 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 this just sounds prophetic to me. So he, he projected a billion dollars in revenue, 2006, 2007 timeframe. Netflix finished 2007 with $1.2 billion in revenue. So almost, almost head on. Wow. Uh, he said that very large companies would try to compete with Netflix and fail. So Amazon, Amazon's prime still trying to do that. We'll see how that plays out. But Blockbuster didn't quite get there. Walmart didn't quite get there. And then finally, this is in 2003, he said uh, they were starting downloadable movies. He said 2005 will be early for downloading and we expect only, only modest consumer interest initially. But we predict this market will grow steadily over the next 10 years. And oh my gosh, look at, look at Netflix now with its streaming service. So what do you think separated Reed Hastings and these, these kind of statements that hit it head on from a lot of the other starry-eyed CEOs that saw big things and never quite got there? That's a great question, and I will give a firm, quick answer. Okay. But I don't pretend that it fully describes the answers that that great question deserves. My quickest, firmest answer to that is that he is a technologist. He's a techie. He thinks in terms of the technology and the growth, and he was in a media business. And I don't really like most of the media companies. Most of them are really big, and I think their CEOs are typically overpaid, and there's a whole bunch of ego out there, and the whole starry-eyed celeb thing, I'm not as into that. I'm more the Silicon Valley fan, and I'm the person who thinks the people who think about the future of technology are going to ace out the media fat cats almost every single time. So I think that Reed Hastings is the smartest guy in the room for his industry. I think you're a pretty smart guy that you went back and read what he was saying 10 years ago. In this fast-paced media world, very few people spend much time looking at the past, but what great lessons. And I, what I enjoyed about that, Matt, was that uh, he used the phrase, and you read it, downloadable movies. No one uses that anymore. <laughs> right, yeah. But back in 2003, I guess that's what he was writing, the annual report, right? Because <laughs> streaming, that whole concept, I guess, wasn't out there. Maybe it was in his head, but the language has even changed. It wasn't too long ago. But um, it's just been a great stock, a great company. They've made mistakes. Every great CEO, every innovative enterprise will. Mm -hmm. They'll make more mistakes in future. But it's been an outstanding investment. It's one of the most widely held stocks among our whole Motley Fool membership. So a whole bunch of prosperity has been created by that person and that company for a lot of us who are watching uh, this video today. That's great. And 
Uh, another one, this is, this is another big success for you here and, and actually just passed a milestone. So Amazon.com, okay, since sure. your first recommendation of Amazon is now a hundred bagger. Which it's actually just, more than that. Maybe <laughs> maybe we celebrated that last month. When I last checked, I think Amazon was up another forty dollars, like three sixty. So I guess now it's a hundred and twenty bagger. <laughs> but I mean, that's going. not a round number, so it's no fun to talk about. And I'm not meaning to brag at all. I mean, I never expected expected that kind of return. Although the only way you get that kind of return is by fighting through a whole bunch of tough times. The last fifteen years have have had two of the most breathtaking market drops of all time. And we just kept holding all the way through, and uh, so anyway, to, I, to a that, lot goes into a 120 yeah. bagger. Yeah, yeah. it's a, the the long term holding really really paid off there. Yeah, but it, one of the things that's always amazed me with Amazon is that Jeff Bezos has been so great about uh, pushing back against Wall Street's need for for the the quarterly profits, the meter beat estimates, that whole that whole deal. Uh, he's pushed back against that. He's been staunch about wanting to invest in this business to make it the best business it can possibly be, as opposed to report some profits right now just to make Wall Street happy. Yep, I agree with How that. How has Jeff Bezos been able to do that? And what can every other CEO out there that's, that's kowtowing to Wall Street learn from him? I just think that that's how he thinks. And he, as the founder of a company, he just practiced what he preached all the way through. And I think he continues to do it. Um, I was just in a meeting earlier today at Full HQ hearing something New. I mean, I can't keep up with all that Amazon's doing at this point. And it's only one of 160 stocks or so that are in the supernova universe. So there's so much to keep up with. But just hearing that, you know, now they're offering kind of streaming data cloud services. So for streaming data, so you think about the future of, um, some people call it the Internet of Things, other people call it machine to machine. Um, most of the data in the future, I think, isn't going to be you and me tapping data into our phones or it's actually just going to be all the machines around us passively collecting information and all of that um, has some value in it. And so Amazon just most recently is now offering the opportunity for partners to sign up and, uh, and benefit from the cloud-based cloud um, streaming data. Uh, so uh, basically, Bezos is constantly thinking about what's next, and he's constantly setting himself and his business up to be prepared for that. He never just thought in terms of books, and he never just thought in terms of e-commerce. He continues to think about where the world's headed, and the world's headed in amazing places. I already can't believe the technology I enjoy today. I mean, I you know even just like my silly jawbone up. I mean, this, this little thing, I mean, it counts all my steps. It counts my hours of sleep. It's fun. It gives me stats. I've got graphs and pie charts of my sleeping. I mean, that's, that's, that's silly crazy. Um, and I, I actually do get more sleep as a consequence of, of caring about that and paying attention to it. So, you know, you just think of that as one silly example, but there's, there's so much to that. And the people who are thinking about that and orienting their businesses to help shape that, and add value to your life and mine as consumers of these products and services, these are the people who are creating real wealth out there, and we're trying to get invested in them as early as possible in, uh, in my services. And hang on and hang on. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes hang on too long. I mean, I, I, I never claim to be great at selling stocks. You know, a lot of time I just don't sell, mm -hmm. because one of the best ways, if you're not good at something, is take it out of the equation altogether. Um, so, I mean, it's not that we never sell. We do, we do issue sell orders from time to time. But for the most part, what I've done as an investor and what we do in Stock Advisor, Rule Breakers, and Supernova is to a fault, if necessary, we tend not to sell. And we are fairly over dramatically rewarded for our laziness and inertia <laughs> as a consequence of doing that. Okay, now I, I did I did some reading back to you from Reed Hastings. Yeah, just before that was great. Downloadable now, movies. Now now I'm going to read back to you a little bit of uh, some David Gardner uh -oh. circle around right, around the same time. All right, good. Uh, so you recommended Marvel back when the first Spider-Man movie was coming out, and and this was this was when Marvel was a hundred seventy million dollar company, and and you said this company has been cranking out toys and comic books for some time before the Spider-Man movie and doing it doing a pretty good business. But this whole realization that Marvel's characters are valuable to more than just 12-year-old boys could and should have occurred back in 1989 when DC Comics inked a deal for the first Batman movie. So you recognized here what was 
a huge, huge inflection point for this company. This was, a, this was an old company that dates back to, I think, the 1960s, right? And, and all of a sudden, they, they started marketing their characters in a whole different way. Uh, the company exploded. It ended up getting bought out by Disney. And, and, and look at where it is now. How do you find inflection points like that? And when do you know whether that it's an inflection point like Marvel's or whether it's a, a faker, for lack of a better way to put it. Yeah, we call those faker breakers over rule breakers. Go. Well, you know, first of all, Matt, I will say, yeah, that, that Marvel investment has ended up being Disney now, and we've held the position all the way through. I think it's up more than 30 times in value. So, But there's two things I want to say that. The first is we're a little late um, in this sense. Uh, we, I recommended the stock after that first Spider-Man movie made a big splash. I think it came out maybe in May. Mm -hmm. Maybe March, April, May of, of that year, 2003-ish, I think. And it wasn't until August or September, after I'd already seen the movie, and after the movie had had a huge box office, that for whatever reason, Marvel stock fell from about nine, where it had risen from, by the way, almost nothing, right. down to maybe five and a half or six. It, it lost about a third of its value in the face of that outstanding performance. And so, you know, I'll just say it's not like I sat ahead ahead in time of the, the Spider-Man movie and said, watch what happens if they start making movies. I didn't. I was reacting to what had already happened. Sure. Uh, so that's one thing I want to point out. The second thing I'd like to point out is that w the reason that Marvel became such a great investment was partly because there was so much skepticism that superhero movies were a fad. <laughs> and that is probably one of my favorite tropes as an investor. I love it when people think something is a fad. And I remember a decade earlier than that, at least, when Starbucks came public. The big rap on Starbucks was coffee houses. Coffee, four bucks, is such a fad. And now look at that hot IPO, and this is a fad. And it wasn't a fad, obviously. They truly reshaped the world around them. And um, you know, there, there have been any number of, of these kinds of investments and sometimes they are fads, by the way. So, you know, I'm not going to claim 100% um, batting average on this. But I love it when people think, you know, oh, that, that Spider-Man movie, man, they're not going to go to number two. Or once they have number two, try with another superhero, you know. And these days, I just went to Thor The Dark World last weekend. I thought it was a great movie, by the way. And Thor, one of my favorite characters probably growing up, really has not even being considered for movies back in 2003, right? There's, there's been so much more content. I think the, the, maybe I said I only had two things. I'll give you a third thing here, which is a bonus. I love it when companies can morph. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but translate what they're doing into um, new opportunities people didn't see. So the classic, the real leverage there was comic stories, comic book, dying medium for the most part. Mm -hmm. But wow, this could actually translate to the silver screen. And think about how much money people make in Hollywood box office versus those poor guys who have their comic book stores. You know, the heart and soul guys who've been selling them. And, and I love some of those stories. By the way, I go to those stores from time to time myself. I usually buy board games when I'm there because they also sell 20-sided dice kind of <laughs> games. But anyway, you know, um, there was so much more money to be made off that content than the comic book medium. And so that was the big aha that I think we had. And I can't say it all happened at once. We just kind of persisted and then started to realize what was happening. Um, side note, let's stay geeky here. I mean, Lord of the Rings. I've always been a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Sure. Those were also just books. That's and then all of a sudden someone thought, you know, this is actually a property. This is not just a trilogy. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take it out to movies. And then a bunch of other things too. Lunchboxes, games, all the rest. But I mean, it's, it's realizing that that initial indication of how you could make money it could get much wider. It happens in biotech. We won't go there right now. But you know, sometimes they'll approve a biotech drug in one situation, but then realize it has additional indications. And that's so. Those are some of the best biotech stocks as well. So it's that optionality, that morphing, that let's let's call it the caterpillar could become a butterfly. And if you see that ahead of time, even if you're late, like the caterpillar is already in the cocoon. Right. You weren't buying it when it was a caterpillar. <laughs> still do pretty well. In fact, you can even let it become a butterfly. If you stick with a butterfly, and you'll still do awfully well as an investor, I think. Well, it was a 20-bagger or 40-bagger. I think that's like three or four butterflies coming out of that. Well, you know, yeah. those are awesome. And, you know, I, I, I want to mention one other stock that uh, just 
because it's probably one of my favorite moments in Motley Fool Stock Advisor history was Priceline, which has probably been my best stock in, in Stock Advisor. And Priceline, we got early, it went up eight times in value, and then I re-recommended it just a few years ago after an eight-bagger. And a lot of people are saying, Dave, <laughs> really? I mean, this one's already up eight times the value. William Shatner, Priceline, after it's up 700%, you're going to recommend it again? And I know you know where I'm headed because it's up more than five times the value since then. And so I think too many people think they've missed it too often. So that and that would go back to Marvel as well with the with the Spider-Man movie is that it was after that. So so you're not necessarily too late just because something has already happened. You know, I, the problem is, and, and we won't go into the whole cycle analysis. And of course, there's the, the anchoring biases and all all, all that talk that um, is its own thing. But too often we as people think looking backward. We're, we're, we're experts at now seeing what's happened. And if something happened well and we didn't do it, we kick ourselves. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we conclude, it's over. I blew it. And I see that all the time in investing. And I do it myself, too. So I know, I know why we do that and, and, the, and that we do do it. Uh, one of the best things you can do is get rid of that instinct and realize it's not about what already happened. It's totally for every stock, any winner we've talked about or loser mm -hmm. in our talk today, that's all irrelevant now. It's actually what happens next. Right? And that's where excellence usually stays excellent. And so you're usually rewarded, even now, for buying Amazon, if you've never bought Amazon, for owning some Amazon starting today, going, you didn't miss it. You know, you haven't missed it at any point in the last 15 years with that stock and many of our other great companies. Great. Well, uh, we've talked about some 20 baggers, some 40 baggers, a 100 bagger. Every once in a while, there's a there's a miss in there and Chris uh, McCree, more than more than every <laughs> once in a while yeah sure I'll say there's a lot while. of them so so looking back at Krispy Kreme when when I looked back at, at your original recommendation of Krispy Kreme what was going on at the time this was a growing company and and certainly it was a an addictive product if I, I mean I still have a Krispy Kreme donut every once in a while uh, myself sure sure um, and, and yet the the company didn't perform as uh, expected certainly the stock didn't perform as expected. What were the lessons that you took? I mean, everything looked so right. What were the lessons that you took away from how south that situation turned? Well, I mean, uh, uh, check my math. In fact, you're good at reading back. And so <laughs> since I'm spontaneously answering Matt, I, I'm, I'm not able to really, my memory's not great, but um, my recollection of Krispy Kreme is that it was very badly mismanaged. The CEO uh, at the time, um, the big debate was how exciting is it to have a new Krispy Kreme open up in a new part of a neighborhood or a city. And the company was really great at hyping that up. There were people waiting around the block and they were able to say, hey, look, we just opened our new one. And it's, you know, people were waiting in line at midnight last night for Krispy Kreme. And the company began to buy back from its franchisees its stores. Mm -hmm. And it had a natural bias toward overpaying. If Matt and Dave started our <laughs> Krispy Kreme, Krispy Kreme, if it was buying back from us, would overpay us because it wanted to make it look like it's so valuable to Sounds have. Like a good deal to us. <laughs> exactly. So, so we did well, but the problem is the company, and then trying to please Wall Street, near-term projections began to. Uh, I, I don't remember if it was fraudulent or not officially, but there were some cookbooks in there, some overstatement of the value of a Krispy Kreme at the unit level, mm -hmm. and that that just crushed the stock. So, um, I mean. I, uh, one, one of my little tricks in, in my small bag of tricks, one of my tricks is trying not to learn too many lessons from my failures. Mm -hmm. I realize it's a great human thing. I always say, hey, you know, you failed. Well, that's the way you learn your lessons. Well, actually, I think I would encourage a lot of us to look more at our successes and ask, what lessons should I be learning from that? And not even from our own, but from the world at large, like successful businesses, successful people. I try to learn as much from those. I prefer those kinds of lessons to looking at my failures. So I tend not to dwell that much on my failures. Um, good news is I can forget them awfully quickly. <laughs> I, I think I lead a happier life. I realize I'm probably oblivious to all kinds of mistakes that I'm making. But um, so I, I didn't learn a tremendous amount from Krispy Kreme. Uh, I guess two quick final reflections on Krispy Kreme. Number one, it isn't a very healthy product. I mean, I, I also enjoy a Krispy Kreme donut, although not as many as I once did. And I prefer to find companies whose products or services, I really do think if they massively proliferated, our world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm. I can't say that about Krispy Kreme. I'm not big time health nut or anything, so I'm not going to make it sound like you're doing something wrong if you're buying from them. But I will say that point number one on Krispy Kreme, 
Redux, looking back, I do prefer companies where if you can see everybody owning and using that product or service, it's a better world. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing about Krispy Kreme is that, um, you know, it's, it, it was kind of a cookbook story. And it happened to me with Satyam Computer, another 90% plus loser on my side of the scorecard in, in Stock Advisor. And I just think we can't all be forensic accountants. We're going to get swindled from time to time. If you own 25, 30, 50 stocks over 20 years or so, these stories are going to pop up here and there. I do think that the world is more and more transparent. And if you're investing in good people and good companies, you're much less likely uh, to have this happen to you. But you can't you know, allow yourself once bitten to be too shy going forward when you have a bad outcome. Sure. All right. Now, transitioning to some of the exciting stories of today. Okay. In, in the, uh, these are mostly from the uh, Supernova portfolio, from, uh -huh. from the Odyssey portfolio in particular, which I, I, I took a fancy to. Great. The, the um, 3D printing industry, which you, which you mentioned earlier, two recommendations there, 3D systems, Stratasys. It's such an exciting industry to me, and, and, and I, love, I love thinking about all the different directions it can go. And yet, as it develops, I think of companies like Apple, like Google, like Facebook, that weren't necessarily the first out there. You know, Apple with cell phones, Google with the search okay. engines, Facebook with, with social media, and they just did it better than everybody else. What is it about 3D systems and Stratasys that you think will let them outpace anybody else that tries to rush in? Well, let me say that um, I never believe that I'm definitely going to be right on any stock. I, even in my favorite stocks, I'm always going to allow a, at least a 20% chance that I'm completely wrong. So please don't take my confidence in these two companies to be any kind of assertion on my part that these are automatic future winners. You're right. The world is full of companies that got out there first, but as is sometimes said, it's the pioneers who get the arrows in their backs, and sometimes those who come after them are the ones who actually start to settle. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, um, in the case of Stratasys, Stratasys is a company that's been, do been there, done that, been doing 3D printing for quite a while at the institutional level, business to business. Mm -hmm. And that's not, I mean, that, that's not easy to recreate for other companies to build those relationships or have that R&D history or have that culture. Mm -hmm. Stratasys has also made some great acquisitions, um, Objet, um, MakerBot. I, basically, it has continued to build itself out into an almost a full-featured 3D printing um, winner, I think. And certainly it has been, looking backwards, a pretty big winner sure. last five years or so. Uh, 3D Systems has a different approach. They're a little bit more consumer-focused, a little bit less B2B. They're also much more about acquisitions. So 3D Systems has been just doing dozens of acquisitions. So in a way, they're kind of rolling themselves up into being a big player, still in an early stage of an important technology. So I think each of those separately are perfectly viable and interesting models to pursue. And the last thing I want to say about 3D printing, although we can keep talking about it if you like, is you know there are going to be a lot of winners. It's like just because Amazon came along and dominated didn't mean that nobody else did e-commerce profitably and well. There are many very fine companies, uh, good stocks we've had that are e-commerce companies over the last uh, 10 years or so. so a big technology like 3D printing, there's lots of winners. In fact, maybe Apple and Google and others will be in there winning a lot. But I don't think that it's going to put Stratasys and 3D Systems out of business. Okay. So, well, with 3D printing, it's, that's sort of a, a new expanding area. When, when I think of Tesla or when I think of Whole Foods, they're transforming traditional industries. Yep. Uh, 3D printing is a good example of a 3D Systems going out into a new area. Facebook and social media, a whole new area. Do you have a preference between companies that are transforming an industry versus pioneering it? That's a great question. I, I don't have a preference. I love them both. I really do. I, I actually think they're kind of the same because I, I, in many cases, the pioneers do, do transform. It's not that you know, whoever's out there first doesn't keep going. I mean, Amazon really was the first big e-commerce company, and lo and behold, uh, 15 years or so later, they're the big e-commerce company, right? So they were the pioneer, and they've transformed They've transformed whole areas of our lives that don't even have anything to do with books online, which is how they started. Me. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, uh, I love the innovators. And innovators very often are pioneers, but sometimes 
they come along second, and maybe they're more effective at transforming. I like the word transform, your word. Uh, I love transformational. I think those businesses, um, if you invest in them, they can transform your life uh, and your investment portfolio if you find them and stick with them. It's not even get there earlier or ahead of everybody else. Right. It's more about sticking with it. How many Motley Fool members do I read about? And, you know, we all do this. I, maybe you kick yourself. I do too from time to time. They like bought a great company early on and then sold it after the money doubled. And 10 years later, it's up 40 more times in value. I've been there. And you know, I, it's not hard to have done if you do think ahead. Like I never bought Yahoo and Yahoo has been, they had some tough times there last years, but from when I first found it, it's up like a 400 times in value or some crazy number. It's, it's, it's more about sticking with things. That's really what most people don't have the patience or the stick to to do. And so it's not about finding the transformational early pioneer. That's one trick. Mm -hmm. The harder thing to do is to hold them. I don't You've find it hard at all because I'm lazy, this. but a lot of people find that very hard. Speaking of, of sticking through tough, tough situations, uh, Tile Shop, which is mm -hmm. a recommendation, there was a, a very critical... I'll say report. It was probably a blog post is maybe a, a better way to describe okay, it. Okay, sure, but, yeah. But a blog, a critical blog post out about the company, and I think the stock was down something like 40% in a single day. What, what is your, how do you deal with a situation like that? I, I mean, that'll, that'll churn the stomach of even the, the, the hardiest investor, I would have to imagine. How do, you, how do you evaluate something like that, and how do you get past to the next day and, and just keep on, keep on investing? Well, I mean, it's I, kind of you to ask. I think you know, you know the answer, and I'm sure you've done it yourself, Matt. I mean, I, I think it's just look past the day or look at the business. Um, you know, I, I, I would encourage, early on, we at The Molly Fool, and I'm talking about like just me and Tom, we didn't even have employees, we saw pump and dump happening in the early days of the online medium. We saw on Prodigy, for anybody who remembers it, and some of the other pre-internet online services, how people were pumping up penny stocks and then uh, presumably selling the shares they owned to the people that they were exciting to buy mm -hmm. those shares, right? Totally short-term phenomenon, highly unethical, in many cases illegal, um, anti-capital F foolish, anti-foolish in every imaginable way. The same thing basically continues to happen today. It's just that for the most part, a lot of that penny stuff has moved on to the opposite, which is shorting companies or taking negative positions and then unleashing a barrage of very short-term hype. And I guess the stock market is not resilient enough or still is willing to believe these sources enough that this is a recurring pattern that anybody who's around the fool, and I know I'm speaking to a lot of people who've who are in our services and have seen this happen to a bunch of our stocks. You just, you and I just talked about three systems. It got pounded for something for for being acquisition oriented a year ago. I mean, these kinds of companies, I guess, are targeted by people with very short term. They probably have a ton of options, and they are selling. Actually, they're buying back their short positions from people who are selling, right down for those brief dramatic drops. Three quick things any investor should think about. Number one, who is the source? of the information. Mm -hmm. For most of the so-called short attacks, there's not even a person. There will be like a name. It'll be on Seeking Alpha, a site that, uh, I think it's typically on Seeking Alpha, a site that I guess you can publish anonymously on. Mm -hmm. And there won't be any p human beings that I can see or any real analysts or names that are, that are willing to put their name right next to that work. So I would always encourage every investor, first of all, who's my source? Number two, What's the, the record of my source? If I can even figure out who the person is or what the, what the hedge fund or analyst or whoever it is, what is that person's long-term track record? I mean, we do it in everything else, right? I mean, I, I want to know, has my doctor been around for a while? Is the person who's teaching me how to ski, has he skied before? You know, all kinds of things that we would normally do. But for some reason, I guess, the stock market, or maybe we have too many machines dialed into auto trade, is willing to just concede 30% drops in good companies in just seconds or minutes based on, let's go back over it. I didn't do number three yet, but number one, who? Like, what's the reputation? What's the name? Who's the human? And number two, what's their record? And then number three, um, keep watching. Number three, it's not about the day. Let's look a month later, 
three months later. Um, that, those, that should be your approach. Those three steps as an investor in these situations. And I, I submit that if there's a fail at any one of those points, probably you're seeing something that is very ephemeral and not even worth your time. I really appreciate in the case of Tile Shop, what our analyst Dave Meyer did, he took the time to read through the screed of the, you know, uh, all of this uh, negativity and, and actually analyze it. He fact checked, um, a lot of it was just flat out inaccurate. Mm -hmm. um, some of it was potentially accurate, it's just uh, rumors. Um, but, you know, at the end, uh, I, I think Dave simply showed our community that if you really take the time to look through it, you'll find that there's not a lot of real there. And then even a month or two or three months later, Matt, those stocks you know, have, have kind of snapped back. And some of our fund members are like, hey, I love these things because now I get to buy great companies at 30% discounts. If that's the way the stock market's going to work, I, I, you know, I buy that. Let me see how far I can get with a one-word question here. Twitter. Uh, Twitter is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a public company now, thanks it to the IPO. Sure Very is. successful. You know, um, I feel like I've already gone on too long in my previous answers, so I'll, I'll try to be quicker on this one. Um, there's a lot. You and I could do a whole 30-minute video just on Twitter. Not that I have that much knowledge, but there's a lot to think about as an investor. I guess my two biggest takeaways are, number one, it is a great company. It has a very real future. And congratulations to anybody who works at Twitter and all those that are helped by Twitter. Most of all, the people who use Twitter. There's millions of them. And obviously, it's a very attractive site framework. And what they've done is add real value to the world in, in ways that you and I, it's hard to even calculate or see that. The whole news industry and on, um, on-site reporting, I mean, it's just amazing. So that's number one. Number two, it could end up being one of our stock picks. I, I haven't looked really deeply at it. Um, Facebook sold off quite a bit from its IPO, and we recommended it then not predicting anything like that for Twitter. Sometimes we buy right near an IPO. I did it with the container store recently for Motley Fool Stock Advisor, so I don't shy away from IPO pricing. Uh, that said, um, I'm not as excited when companies already have valuations in the tens of billions of dollars. You know, when we bought Amazon, or you, you talked about earlier in the interview, Netflix, you know, was down at a much smaller market cap. You know, you could see how that could go up 10 times in value. You could see how maybe a company that was only at $200 million of market cap or even $1 billion, how that could become $10 billion. When a stock starts at $20 plus billion or $40 billion, I mean, it's still interesting to me because I think Twitter could easily double from here and beat the market handily over the next five to 10 years. Absolutely. Is it going to be a mega winner? No. I think a lot of people come new to investing. They hear Twitter. I mean, the news was full of the Twitter IPO, right? Even if you weren't watching financial news, it was all out there. Everyone's like, are you going to buy Twitter? Couldn't miss As it. if, yeah, I know, you couldn't miss it. And I think it's kind of fun that the stock market hits the headlines like that from time to time. But I think a lot of people who don't really know investing think that the whole thing is, could you buy it that first day and maybe sell it for a 40% gain later in the day, I guess. The answer is no, never, really. The, that 70% gain you're hearing is from the pre-IPO pricing to where it kind of first trades in most cases. So anything like Twitter, to close this long, shaggy second point, it's not about the first day. It's about, is it going to be a winner 10 years from now? And by the way, that's true of every stock, whether it's IPO or not, or at least that's how, how we think of it. Okay, let me, let me wrap up here with a, with a selfish question. I, I started out the interview by saying I've got a little bit of a value investor bent to me. When I, when I hear you talk about this, when I think about the big opportunities out there changing and transforming industries, when I hear about the optionality that you talk about in these companies, and when I think about trying to get that word overvalued out of my vocabulary a little bit more, when you think about all that, what is, what is a company that you could recommend to me to help me uh, for some therapy, we'll call it some therapy, some stock therapy, to get away from overvalued and to think about optionality and big, big opportunities? It's a great question, Matt. Um, I, I, there's a bunch of companies that I could answer right now because um, there are so many interesting, innovative companies. I, before I give my answer, I want to say, I know you said value investor, and I think you know this about me, but I never use the phrase value investor or growth. I, I don't like those because I just feel like they're self-limiting. And, and the truth is, I also don't like phrases like, and this is just a brief note that I almost never sound Democrat and Republican. <laughs> I think those are labels that 
try to mean too much and they end up just being divisive and they don't actually really help the world or the conversation in my opinion. So I, don't, I never say I'm a growth investor or if you do see me saying that, please slap me <laughs> uh, because I didn't mean to because that's not how I think about it. So you and I are both investors mm -hmm. and we're both looking to grow our money over time. We're looking to maybe mix some safer ones and some riskier ones and invest most of all, I hope, in companies that in some ways express who we are through the companies that we're selecting, right? I don't think you should be picking things that you know nothing about because Dave said it or Matt said it, right? I think sure. uh, in a lot of ways your portfolio should look like your bookshelf. It should show a lot about you based on what you're spending time with. Mm -hmm. All that said, um, a, a, a good company that challenges a lot of preconceived notions is Zillow. Zillow, right? So that that a lot of us have used Zillow probably as a consumer. You tap in and see how much is my house worth, or that neighborhood that we're looking. You know, so using the internet to, I used to say disrupt bricks and mortar. In this case, it's there's no bricks and mortar, and I'm not even sure there's that much disruption. Using the internet to do real estate better, um, and I think what's attractive about Zillow is. It's very early on still. The company is a $3 billion market cap. That, by the way, is maybe about $2 billion more than about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So it's been a tremendous stock already. But you and I know, because, and if you were watching earlier, you know that that shouldn't cause you to shy away and think, I miss Zillow. The truth is, where's the world headed? Toward even more real estate trading, even more use of the internet. And where are you going to go? You're going to go to the dominant brand name or two mm -hmm. within that space that has global possibilities. You're going to go to a company that has a visionary CEO, a great culture, and, uh, and finally, you're going to be buying a stock that has a crazy PE, <laughs> right? You know, I would never have paid that that much before. When we bought Zillow, it was overvalued. That's part of what we liked about it. It looks overvalued now. And so I think, you know, that's a good example. There's a lot of others. But I'll just, and, and I, I'm not even here to say that's the stock, or I hope nobody watches this video and says, Dave said buy Zillow. I'm giving an example of a company that exhibits how I think about investing that challenges a lot of people's preconceived notions about what works in investing. Well, consider it on my watch list. Right. Love it. Excellent. Well, David, thank you so much. This has been great. This has been very instructive. And once again, thank you so much for joining me. Matt, it's my pleasure. Let's do it again. Absolutely.